Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. As uh, Moses said <laughs> in one of the Psalms, he says, you establish the work of our hands. It's your work. You do it. You just work through us. And Lord, we just pray this morning as we jump into this passage in 1 Corinthians 10, that you would open up our hearts, help us to understand what you have called us to, and help us to enact this in this life. Lord, you have a mission for us. Help us to fulfill it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so just to let you know, this is actually the message I preached at church last Sunday night. So if you were here, you might recognize it. <laughs> Um, Pastor Steve asked me to speak on this this morning because of our Bearing Hope term. And what, what the aim of our Bearing Hope term is to really get us thinking about how we can bear hope in our community, in our families, in our workplaces, in, in the Beanley and, and wider area. How can we be the lights that God called us to be? So this morning we're going to look at Jesus, the friend of sinners. And I want to begin by asking you this question. How do you think about your life? See, I think... Many Christians actually think in very worldly ways, like this. For a lot of Christians, life is about going to school, doing well at that school, getting a good education, and then once you get a good education, it's about finding what you like doing and making a career of it. And then so the next stage of life is, you know, you, you find your career, you get established, and then many young Christians along the way, after a certain amount of time, they might find someone and marry them, and then they will focus on that, and then after a while they might have kids, and then they have those children, and they decide to raise them in the exact same way. Of course this will be sanctified. Many Christians don't think in terms of uh, careers, or, but so much they more to think in terms of passions or the desires that God has placed on their life, or what they can achieve with great dreams. That's the way Christians tend to think of it this way, but the result in the end is exactly the same. More often than not, we tend to approach life in the same way with the same thought processes and thinking as people in the world. Education, career, sporting events, hobbies, and then if we have enough time, we go to church on Sunday. And if you notice that as our society has gotten busier, we too as Christians have gotten busier because we approach life in the exact same way. How do you think about your life? Do your priorities circle these things? Or do you think in terms of mission, that our whole life is to be centered around the mission that God has given us? You know, all these things, career, education, family, activities, all of these are good things. But the difference for us who are believers is that we are not to serve these things, but these things in our life are meant to serve the mission that God has called us to. And to put it another way, is God at the center of why you do everything that you do? Or is he just an added extra? Or I could put it this way, if you were to take God out of your life, and all that changed was that you had some spare time on Sundays and on one night during the week, then maybe you have to really rethink your priorities. Our God has invaded this world, and he continues to invade this world through his people. He wants to work in this world through us. And this passage we're going to look at this morning, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 31 to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, shows us, Paul shows us how we can recenter our priorities around the mission that God has called us. Before we look at our passage, though, I want us to look at the context. What was the occasion for Paul writing? See, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul's actually writing to the Christians and give them guidance about how to engage with unbelievers. You see, they were meeting with and eating with unsaved pagans. And because they were doing this, it was bringing up questions. Where should they draw the line? How far should they go? What could they engage in with the unbelievers and what could they not engage them in? You know, while they were eating with them, they may have even heard a pagan prayer like this one. I found this one on, uh, on Google. I just typed in pagan prayer and this came up. Uh, Earth who gives to us this food. So this is, you know, when the, the ancient um, 
pagans in the Greek world, when they would eat, what they would actually do is they would take their food and they would offer it before an idol and pray to that idol, and then they would eat whatever was left over. I hear the pagans never went hungry. <laughs> that is what they used to do. You know, but it's important to understand that the questions that were raised from eating with unbelievers are good things because it shows, these questions that are raised, shows that the Christians were engaging with the very people God called us to engage, those who do not yet know him. You know, to live faithful, missional Christian lives actually looks messy and raises Christians, but As Christians, we prefer to easily divide our lines. We like to have our society box over here and our Christian box over here, and we never want the two to come together. It's safer. That's why we tend to withdraw away from society and avoid society as much as possible because we feel safer. But that's not what we're meant to do. Christianity is actually meant to be messy. It's meant to throw up questions about how do we engage, how do we meet with people. Think about this. Jesus... The God of the universe, holy, pure, fully loving, had to step out of the pure heaven into this world which isn't. Think of the difference between heaven and our world. The difference between heaven and our world is a much bigger gap than our Christian social circles and anything else. And yet he wasn't afraid to engage. And thank him that he wasn't. (laughs) Because we are here today because of that. What we should be doing is living the gospel-centered life. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now you may be wondering, firstly, how did you come up with that title for this verse, man? I mean, we all know this verse, don't we? In fact, we use it often. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. But what does it mean? What does it mean to do all that we do for God's glory? Well, to glorify someone, to glorify God means to give him the weight that he is due. But does that really help us? I mean, does that really help us put into practice what it actually means to live for the glory of God? And the good news is that Paul helps us himself in 2 Corinthians. He says this, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of of God. So the gospel, the gospel shines the light on the glory of Christ, who is God's image, who represents God, because he is God. The gospel shows us his glory. I mean, Jesus said this just before he went to the cross, the night before he went, in his last prayer, the one which he prayed, remember how he asked the disciples to watch and pray with him? This is one of the things he was praying when he asked that. He said, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had before the world existed. Jesus' whole life glorified God, his Father, God the Father. But the pinnacle of the glory of his life was the cross. The pinnacle of the glory of God is the cross. Because on the cross, what did God do? He did two things. Firstly, he vindicated himself. He proved that he was righteous and just in forgiving sinners. And two, he paid the penalty for all of our sins in one beautiful act. As Zechariah says in his book, I think it's Zechariah 7 verse 11 or 12, round about there, he says this, administer true justice, show compassion and mercy. Don't you love that? Administer true justice. Show compassion and mercy. That's the cross right there. True justice. All our sins forgiven, dealt with, God glorified. So I would say that our verse, whatever you do for the glory of God, means this. In whatever you do, do it in such a way that it shines the light on the God who died for your sins and the sins of the whole world. In other words, to glorify God means to live the gospel-centered life. So at work, work like someone who is redeemed, whose sins have been paid for, who has a better hope than just a promotion. When you're at school, 
Let it be known that you do your work out of a worship for the God who died for you on the cross. When you're hanging out with your friends and your social activities, remember that God loves them and he died for your sins and their sins. And seek to find ways to share that gospel in all those encounters. The missional life is that we redeem it all for his mission because he redeemed us. We are seeking to witness and to share the gospel in every opportunity. That's what it means to live for the glory of God. And obviously, all the holiness and the way that God asks us to live comes along with that. You know, we see Paul talking about this when he talks about the pagans in 1 Corinthians 10. If you look at verse 28, he says this, But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then don't eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience, I do not mean your conscience, but his. What's he saying here? Well, as I said before, in in the ancient ancient world, everyone worshipped one god or a million gods, or they, you know, all the pagans worshipped a god of some kind. They would have their favorite god, and so during a meal, they might actually take that food, as I said, and offer it to the god either before, like we said, or during. Now, Paul says, "Don't eat it," but not because that false god means anything to us. Idols mean nothing to Christians. We know that idols aren't true. There is one God, only one God. So for the Christian, it's okay to eat it because we know that God isn't true. But he's saying, don't eat it for their sake. In other words, you draw a line in the sand because to eat with them is to help them participate in sin because they are sinning by giving glory to a false God. So you do not partake for the sake of the other person. This is the focus that we have in our life. Always, in every opportunity, every encounter, thinking, how can I be a witness for the sake of others, for the sake of God and his mission? In other words, we do this with care for others. You know, Here's this verse for all the peace lovers (laughs) and the politically correct people amongst us. This is what Paul says here, verses 32 to 33. He says, Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Give no offense. Is the radical Paul apostle, sorry, I said that backwards, is the radical apostle Paul, who was so offensive sometimes when he preached the gospel that he was stoned and beaten on multiple occasions, really saying that we are never to offend anyone. I mean, think about this. Paul got up in front of a crowd of Jews that were already angry. They had already rioted and tried to kill him in Acts. And then he gets up and he says, look, God's given salvation to the Gentiles, the worst thing you could say to a Jew in that day. They were furious already and he offends them again. Is the Apostle Paul really saying that we should never offend anyone and just seek to people please anyone? Remember, he said in Galatians, I am not now trying to please man, but please God. He actually says, don't be a people pleaser. Of course he's not. What this means, if you've got the NIV there, it actually translates it very well. It says, do not cause someone to stumble. The Greek word for offense here, it actually means do not cause that person to commit an offense. Do not cause them to commit a crime, whether against God or against society. In other words, he's saying this, don't be a witness in such a way that you make people want to sin. (laughs) And that's possible. Christians can be so obnoxious sometimes that we make people want to sin by the way we seek to be witnesses, don't we? I mean, a good example of this is Westboro Baptist. You guys have probably heard of, if you don't know Westboro Baptist by name, and thanks to Steve, I know where it is now, (laughs) in Westboro. You had to be there last Sunday night to get that one. Um, So this is a church which is really hateful to the world. And what they do is, they like, for example, they went to Heath Ledger's funeral and stood outside it with these signs saying, God hates homosexuals. And this is how they seek to witness. And you know what? I've seen the way unbelievers respond to them, and they cause unbelievers to sin towards them because of the way they witness. This is the definition of being obnoxious. 
doing it in a hateful way. I'm not saying that all protests are wrong. I'm just saying this is not the way to witness. Standing out the front of funerals, standing out the front of the funerals of soldiers saying, God hates America. That is not the place or time to do that. If you can even say that. There are ways in which we can witness which can be obnoxious. We are instead to be a witness in such a way that it doesn't create barriers, but it breaks down barriers. We want to we want we want to do it in a way which the gospel is as pleasing as possible to a person's ears. I mean, it's actually impossible to never offend anyone. Think about this. It is offensive to say to a Muslim that Jesus is the son of God. Why is that? Because in Islamic thought the idea of God having a son is just highly offensive to them. Allah is one to them, not the Trinity. They find that offensive. It is offensive to say to a Mormon that Joseph Smith was a con man, a convicted felon, for being a con artist, even though it's true. It's offensive to say to your average Australian friend that we need to repent of our sins, even though it's true and we have to say it. It's impossible to never offend anyone. But living in such a way that we seek other people's advantage and give them no extra reasons to sin, now that's not impossible. It is hard, but it's not impossible. So what does it look like to seek the advantage of others in our witness? Well, think about the places you hang out with unbelievers. How can you remove barriers to share with them the gospel? How can you remove barriers? Maybe you have a co-worker who is struggling with something at work, a non-Christian co-worker. Maybe you can just say to that person, look, can I pray for you? They might think that is strange. They might not. I don't know them. But you're just seeking their advantage. Maybe you can help them out practically in some way. You know, at school, is there someone being bullied? Is there a non-Christian person being bullied that you can actually defend them? As it says in the Bible, defend the weak. Speak up for the oppressed. And there you create yourself an opportunity to witness to this person. They ask, why did you do that for me? Because Jesus loves you. Maybe you are blessed financially and you have a non-Christian friend or you just know of an unbeliever who's really struggling. You can buy them some food or buy them a gift or do something to help them out. In other words, be a witness in such a way that you break down barriers to being a witness for God. And in doing this, you actually create opportunities to share. Whereas Westboro Baptists shut down (laughs) opportunities. I mean, come on, guys. Those guys need to really change their approach. You know, Paul's goal was to save people. Is that our goal? Is that really our focus in our relationships as unbelievers? Jesus was the friend of sinners. He went to their parties. He went to their homes, to their social networks. But he did this for a purpose, because he loved them And he wanted to be a witness so they could know about the salvation they had in him. He sought their advantage by becoming a servant. So in being missional, in having this focus in our lives, we really become just like Jesus. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. You know why this statement is so significant? Because what was the difference between Paul and all the other apostles? Paul never actually walked with Jesus in his earthly ministry. He met Jesus. Jesus He encountered Jesus in an incredible way. But he didn't actually walk with Jesus in his ministry. What he had was the words of the apostles, which eventually became the Gospels. In fact, he had, in essence, he had what we had, or probably less so. He didn't have access to all four Gospels. I mean, who was one of Paul's missionary workers? Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts. So Paul would have studied this, and one of the things you find when you study the Gospels is the focus Jesus had, the singular focus that he had for reaching out to the lost. Look what it says in Mark chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. And as he, that's Jesus, reclined at table in his house, 
Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? In other words, why does he eat with the undesirables? Why does he eat with those people? The kind of people you shouldn't really hang out with. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This was his focus. He came to those in need. The more sinful from human perspective, the more in need Jesus saw them. He didn't avoid people like this. He sought them out. The kinds of people that you tell your kids to stay away from, he sought them out. The kinds of people you tell your husband not to see on the weekend, he sought them out. The kinds of people you don't invite to your house, he sought them out. This was Jesus' focus. Jesus, the friend of sinners. If we want to be more like Jesus, we need to see our lives in terms of missions. Listen to me. Every one of you, not just pastors, not just evangelists, every one of you who is here this morning who knows Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to see yourself as called to the same mission Jesus was called, to seek and save those who need him. This is our focus, together. This means we must engage. No more withdrawing, no more hiding from society. Well, when we do withdraw, we gather together like in church. To What does it say? Why do we gather together in Hebrews? To spur each other on to love and good deeds. <laughs> the whole point of coming together is to inspire us to go out there and love people. And how do we love them? By doing many things, including sharing the gospel. Take a, just picture in your mind your week. How can you change something in your week which enables you to connect with unbelievers? How can you do something? Maybe, maybe it's a social event. Maybe you do karate. Maybe you do uh, mountain biking. Maybe you do, I don't know what you do. You know your week better than me. What is the way you can change your week? I've got an idea for the older people here, which is something which I, I, I take it or leave it, but I've been down to the Eagleby Tavern every now and then. I haven't gone there for a while, but we used to live there, and I used to go there and, and see the amount of older people that would sit there and play the pokies. Maybe you could go and sit with them and share the love of Jesus with them and maybe distract them from wasting their money on the pokies. But just think of the opportunities. For every generation here, there are opportunities to be missional in the community. Be creative in how you do this. We, and we, in doing this, we must break down barriers or find ways to share Jesus in people's lives. You know, William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said this, Give a man a loaf of bread and he will listen to you about the bread of life. In other words, what's he doing? He's creating an opportunity. He's also making sure the guy's not too hungry to listen. <laughs> Be creative. Think of ways to love your neighbors. Think of ways to love your friends. Think of ways to love the stranger. You know, who is our neighbor? Jesus said everybody, basically. That's the whole point of this parable of the Good Samaritan. Be creative in breaking down these barriers. But also remember this. Jesus was the friend of sinners, but many sinners rejected him. In fact, if you read John chapter 6, we actually see at one point in Jesus' life, almost all of his disciples left because of, the, the, because of his message. He never compromised on the message. Who stayed? <laughs> the disciples. The 12 disciples stayed. And when Jesus says to him, he says, have I offended you too? Are you guys going to leave? You know what Peter said? He said, to who else will we go? You have the words of life. So being the friend of sinners doesn't mean that everyone's going to love you. Jesus taught us to expect rejection from some, even many. Being a friend of sinners just means that we seek to encounter many so that some will be saved. And we accept the rejection from those who aren't interested. So to wrap this all up, what did Jesus say in the Great Commission? Go out into all the world 
and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them everything I have commanded you, and truly I will be with you till the end of the age. You know that's the call for all of our life, is to just make disciples. In our everyday life, just find ways to make disciples. Because Jesus did that, we are here today. And the church will still be here in a thousand years if God hasn't returned yet. Because he wants to work through his church. And he invites you to be a part of that. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for all that you've done. We know that uh, we cannot do this in our own strength. And we know that you set the perfect example and we, we cannot be perfect. We don't have to be perfect. You were the perfect one who paid the penalty for us. Well, we just want to ask you something really simple. We just ask that you would help us to love people in our lives and seek to share with them the gospel. Help us to do this in a way which breaks down barriers. <coughs> Help us to do this in a way which shows how pleasing you are. You are the God of this universe. You love us. You died for us. Lord, I just pray that for every single person who's here this morning who already knows you, that you would just do this in their life. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who does not believe in you, who has walked away, may, you, may they encounter you this morning and know their Lord, that you are their Lord and may you today become their saviour. In Jesus' name.